What's going on, guys? Welcome to another episode of Eastern Current. I'm your host, Captain Judd Brock. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I listen to all these these cool podcasts with really good intros, and my, I feel like mine kind of stinks, but I just got really uncomfortable trying to do it differently. Um, <laughs> thanks for checking out another episode of Eastern Current, guys. Got my buddy Cameron on here, y'all's buddy Cameron, uh, and we're gonna we're gonna chat about quite a few things today. So. Um, we missed, I was on a family vacation to the Keys last week, um, so I was not able to do one, but glad to be back this week, uh, bringing y'all some fresh content here from North Carolina and the East Coast. Um, I want to thank Marshware, a uh, sponsor of this podcast. I want to thank uh, iStrike as well, um, and we're uh, excited about some cool stuff with release over 20 that's coming up, so just stay tuned for that. Um, hold on one second. Let me plug this thing in. I'm going to go ahead and introduce Cameron first. What's going on, man? Not much. How's your uh, How's your fishing been lately? It's been um, pretty good. It's, it's definitely feels like it started to get into that transition period where they can um, become a little unreliable. Yeah, it's uh, it is it is becoming that point. It's like that. Uh, I don't know if it would be late spring. Is it late spring or early spring when that happens too? I can never. I can't remember. I think it's. I think it's like late spring. Um, once it starts feeling like summer, it's kind of the same type of deal. If they start, the fish start transitioning, um, and trying to figure out where they want to be and breaking up. And it it can be a little bit tough to like put your finger on where exactly they're going to be that day. Yeah. And I feel like the same thing kind of happens this time of year, but luckily we have false albacore to kind of, uh, (laughs) to make that still a fun time of year, I guess. Yeah, for sure. It's uh, I'm looking forward to them, honestly. Because usually I've already tried to fish for them pretty hard at this point of the year, and I'm already a little kind of like burnt out on it. Not burnt out, mm-hmm. but it's the the excitement's not there yet. But like waiting until maybe October to like start albacore fishing is, is pretty awesome because you you know that's when it gets good. I, I feel like usually I've like been trying to fish for them since the end of August. Yeah, um, but they just yeah. haven't. I don't know. Maybe maybe some other people that are listening might know, but I haven't been out in the ocean enough to really look for them um i've heard some stories of i bumped into a couple groups and heard of people bumping into a few groups but um that's an exciting time of year we're getting into we're in like a kind of a lull period but getting into like a really exciting time of year what do you think about all this uh weather we just had though up and down the east coast yeah that was a lot of rain um i don't know i feel like sometimes that rain when it's that much i mean i had like a five gallon bucket outside and it was completely full after like three days or so of rain. So I'm just curious, like how many inches we actually got. But um, I don't know. I think I think it can definitely put uh, not pressure on the fish, but it can make them move for at least a few days, and and then sometimes they'll come back to the same spots. But uh, I think it makes it a little tough. One, because the water's dirtier, uh, and two, because generally after those rains, it cools down. A little yeah. bit um so I don't, I, I don't know it's always kind of interesting to see like how it affects them and and where they go and if they come back to the same spot after you know five days or so after those big rains um so i wouldn't i wouldn't probably fish like in the river quite yet from my perspective just because i bet it's you've told me this too before i feel like it takes a few days after a big rain for all that wash out to kind of come into the river basin yeah area um not to say it's not good i just think it would be if you're sight fishing it would be really dirty and kind of tough for sure it's uh yeah i had a trip this afternoon there actually had a trip this morning and this afternoon down there and we just decided to reschedule both of them because it was my my afternoon trip was driving in from from Polly's Island and um, which is down kind of near South Emerald Inlet, so pretty far down into South Carolina. And I just felt just with the unknown of of what was going to play out, I felt mm-hmm. bad having them drive. And the guy was retired and could come anytime, so um, we were we decided to, to wait. I'm going to send him some other dates and hopefully get out there. But um, yeah, it's you know it seems like, and I guess it's because it's hurricane season. We always get some storm or two with like a lot of rain that pushes through, and we mm-hmm. deal with this every late summer, early fall. Um, but man, it feels good outside. Like it's got me really wanting to fish. Yeah, I know. And then I'm like, 
thinking about the water quality too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Every time it starts to cool off, I definitely start getting uh, the speckled trout fever. Me too. I also want to start killing things, which I've been going at <laughs> lately too. So, um, been a little distracted from my fishing quarries lately, but um, excited for. I'm really excited for trout in Albacore this year, and Albacore mm-hmm. more so than than years past. I'm just excited to get in the ocean and put around a little bit. Um, so we'll we'll see. I'm sure after this blow, I mean the temperature out there. I think the Alan. I was talking to Alan Kane last night. He's actually heading to Montana for a couple of days, but he said that the ocean temperature had dropped five degrees, and so that means the inshore water should have dropped at least seven or eight degrees, if not a little yeah. more. Um, over the past two days, but especially the rain will bring the temperature down as well as, you know, this, this cooler area that we've got. And we're supposed to have cooler temperatures through the beginning of next week right now. So I'd be very surprised if, and I don't think we're going to, we might see a little trickle of migratory trout. Mm-hmm. I don't think that's really going to start yet, but we're going to see the local trout starting to feed into the day more a instead better. of just being yeah. such a morning thing. So that gets me excited because man. That's one thing you can go do with clients, like when the trout are biting good, and you can have two or three clients throwing artificials at the same time. So, it, like, mm-hmm. you know, I get to kind of retire the mullet game, and you know, for now, just fly fishing sure. for redfish and, and trout fishing if I've got a larger crew. Um, but what would you say your? I have talked about a little bit. Is like you're most excited about for this time of year. What's your? What, what gets you the most fired up? Is it the trout? Um. Yeah. I mean, I think overall, it's definitely the trout, just because there's so much fun to catch in my opinion and it's a really good change of pace i'd say from like fishing for redfish for the majority of the time um from you know mid spring all the way through summer i feel like it's really kind of my focus is redfish uh and then the you know the summer trout when they're biting which was kind of like early summer and then it kind of shut off for a while when it got hot um and starting to pick up back up a little bit, as you were saying, with like the local trout. Um, but I would say, yeah, for sure, uh, speckled trout is uh, what I'm most excited for. But it's kind of hard for me to say because I really, really like fishing for false albacore as well. Yeah. Um, and I think the reason being just because when you, when you uh, take people or – you go yourself and you're fly fishing for redfish for uh that like months and you know the spring is not super hard to catch them on fly and then it gets harder and harder and harder in my opinion uh through the summer because they just get really spread out you're fishing to like singles or pairs or a group small really small groups of them um, and they're so keyed in on mullet a lot of times it's just you have to put the fly like in the perfect spot i mean it's super rewarding, but it's really challenging. Yeah. Um, and to have a species of fish like false albacore where they just, you know, you put it right in the middle of them when they're bussing and start retrieving it and it's probably going to get eaten um, is always super exciting. Um, so I would, I would just urge anyone, you know, if you're looking to get into fly fishing, uh, false albacore is like, probably the best species to start with in my opinion yeah i would agree Uh, but i will play devil's advocate real quick and interrupt you yeah please go ahead that though albies can be some of the most you know easy fish to catch super straightforward when they decide to be difficult and like not want to eat they can be the most frustrating fish Mm -hmm. in the entire Mm -hmm. world at the same time so there's no doubt i would say more times than not though at least in my experience if they're up and feeding and you're finding groups of birds um, you're gonna, you probably catch one on fly. Yeah, as long sure. as you can catch, sure. uh, like somewhat decently. Um, and the other cool thing about, I think, fishing for albies too is if you're into like tying your own flies, the flies to tie for them are like super easy. You Very can whip easy. out like <laughs> ten of them in an hour, yeah, um, if not more. Uh, so that's always kind of cool catching something on something you made, and then um, not to mention they're like probably the only fish. Um, in our area that will get you into the backing of your fly reel <laughs> quick too <laughs> very quick i call them deep water bonefish i think i've said that like five times on this show before but deep I, water bonefish i always forget that little term you have for them that's a very very good term for them 
Uh, deep bottom yeah, this, I, I think overall I'm most excited for Trout, um, but I'm really excited for False Abacore too. Yeah, I would agree. Um, just to, It's just cool that we get like a, a, a change with like two or three kind of new outlets, if that makes sense. Yeah, but, um, definitely. Yeah, this 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 time of year is always so fun. You know, the there's so many things you start thinking about as an outdoorsman when that weather starts cooling off a little bit. You know, deer hunting and duck hunting and trout fishing and whatnot. And then all of a sudden you're in the dead of winter and it's like, ooh, you know, miss fall. And but then you're looking forward to spring. It's it's funny. It's like I think North Carolina the seasons are about perfect. You know, maybe if summer was a little bit shorter and fall was a little bit longer, I would like that yeah. more. Yeah. But. <laughs> Um, cause sometimes we don't really get a fall. It's like, you know, it's super freaking hot and then it's winter time, but, um, same with our spring. Yeah, that's the truth. Um, there's no doubt about that. Are you, uh, so you've got the new boat on order. I do. What's yeah. the, uh, what's the verdict on that? Cause last time I talked to you, you were just waiting on a motor like a lot of other people. Same, same, same situation. Have they have they talked to you at all and told you anything? Yeah, I'll probably I'll probably reach out to them uh, once every two or three weeks to try and get an update, and the answer is always the same. But uh, it, the the like time frame that they gave me for how long it would take was like anywhere from five to six weeks all the way up to like three months. So. God, Hopefully it's here in time for um, Albacore season. I'm, I'm kind of thinking it might not be, but worst comes to worst, I can always just seize the, the old beater, Boston Whaler. Yeah, that's true. But man, that sucks, especially when you ordered it so long ago. Are they have they offered you any type of like discount or anything like that because it's taking so long? No, but that's a good point. I should yeah. bring that. Up. You should bring up that you're going to lose money because you're we're supposed to be guiding off of you're supposed to run Albacore trips. It's taking a long time. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah, so, but, I mean, it'll still be, I think that having a update that will be fun for the winter, too, just, like, kind of exploring more mid-river stuff, uh, up-river stuff. Um, so, it's just so much easier to get to those places with uh, just putting in one place and being able to run, like, pretty far. So, you're going to trailer that boat everywhere? For the most part, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that'll be nice. Oh yeah, you said you might keep it on on a dock for a little bit, but yeah, but trailering it a lot. Um, yeah, man, it's l- looking at it now. It's like I wish I had like a a thirty foot boat on a lift, and then like a twenty four foot bay boat on a trailer and a skiff on a trailer. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> hey, you need three boats around here to have the perfect arsenal. You really do, man. You <laughs> really do. It's not realistic for me, at least. Definitely not realistic. Yeah, unless you're. If you're making a fishing guide's wage and owning even three boats, like I have, is miserable. <laughs> Just always paying for boat stuff. But um, yeah, four boats you need to be doing. You need to be making some money to pay for them. Yeah. I don't care what they are. It's like you're, if you want to keep them all running, they're going to be <laughs> draining yeah. your pockets. Yeah. As your skiff and holding up good this year, any big any big fixes on your skiff? Um, not really. Uh, I, I've started to do like all the um, gel coat and stuff work on my own, which has caught, saved me a ton of money because that gets pretty expensive. Um, I'm trying to think. I've had like some trolling motor issues and some trolling motor charger issues. Uh, but other than that, is uh, everything's been fairly minor. Luckily, like no motor problems or anything like that. Yeah, that's good. It's, uh, I got a few things to fix on my boats, but for the most part, we're doing pretty good. Um, well, let's talk a little bit about trout fishing, I think, because that's, I mean, albacore fishing is pretty straightforward. If you haven't, yeah. if you're really interested in albacore fishing, we've got some, if you look back in our episodes, we have some like just albacore fishing podcasts, which we'll probably do one of those in the peak of the season this year again, too. Um, but right now, I think what's more applicable to more people is is some late summer, early fall trout fishing talk. Um and so I, I'm excited about that. I want to get into that and kind of go through kind of some of the tackle that, that we like to fish. There's one bait that me and Cameron both like, we'll, and we'll see if y'all can guess it. <laughs> if you think you know what it is and you're watching this video, 
leave it in the comments below. And I know I'll, I'll be able to see when you let when that, that won't make sense. But try to guess just for your own sake what bait I'm talking about that me and Cameron both love. Yeah. And leave it in the comments. <laughs> and and I'm, I'm excited to see who knows. But um, but yeah, let's uh let's talk a little bit about that, Cameron. What is some of the first? Where are some of the first places you start looking for trout? Even if they're not migratory fish, like mm, you yeah. know, this time of year, what's some of the stuff that you like to, to target and, and, and hopes to find fish? Sure. Um, so I think uh, a point that you brought up earlier was a good one, which is um, a lot of the times if you were catching trout somewhere like uh, late spring and you hadn't fished there or you you'd fished there a couple times after you had caught some trout there and you didn't get any bites – those are like some of the first places I would start hitting yeah. again because um, a lot of times I just feel like it has to do with the water temperature yeah. and, and, when, and, and when they're eating because maybe they're at that spot but they're eating at night. Um, but I did that the other day. There was a, a, a spot that I had caught them pretty good when it was still you know not 90 degrees outside and um, we had one cool morning and the tide was right and went in there and caught like 10 Thank you. Uh, pretty quickly. So I, I think having like some of those spots that you had fished early summer where you're catching trout is probably where I'd start because like you said, it's mostly still going to be your residential fish and it's just that they're starting to eat a little better just because the water temperature's gone down. Definitely. Um, and I mean, I still use the lure I mean, am i allowed to say the lure that we were talking about yeah it's been enough time now people have had time to ponder on it remember before okay. cameron says it see if you can see if you can guess in the comments. <laughs> yeah. i'm curious to so, see how, if people have, if we've beaten them over the head with it <laughs> the the doa red flake shrimp um worked really well the fish finder the fish finder yeah and then um i didn't throw it that day but uh, i know that if you're there early in the morning and and you're at the spot where you had caught them before, I would definitely say throwing those little spooks. Uh, it's always a good one to start off with, or like a she dog. Um, uh, just top waters in general, I feel like it might be a good way Speaking to get Speaking of ready. little spooks, just while you're thinking about it, I keep talking. I'm just going to grab this real quick. All right, so little spooks, and if you're listening, I'm sorry that you can't see these, but my brother sent me some of these. He's a big bass fisherman, fishes a bunch of tournaments and whatnot, um, but this is a new head and product, and it is even smaller than the Spook Junior. Oh, wow. It is maybe two inches long. Which I think will be a, a cool little a cool little bait for trout fishing. Is yeah. I think redfish, man. I think redfish will smoke this thing like real calm water. This would be a really good sight fishing bait for redfish if you wanted to sight fish with a topwater plug. Especially like early in the summer. Yeah, the bait still kind of small. Yeah, for sure. I'm excited about it. But they got a bunch of colors. Y'all should go check them out. I, I know they're gonna sell out because that fall the fall bass fishing on topwater. So go get you a couple of these from Heading. Um, they are called. The Super Spook B O Y O. Boyo? Boyo. Super Spook Boyo. Um, they got some good colors in there. I mean, some really good looking. That, that, that color's cool. A little it's pink a nice, belly. Like, natural color. Then this. I feel like this will be what you would gravitate towards, Cameron. A lot of pink in there. <laughs> yeah. Um, Definitely. I love pink for trout for some reason. Yeah, and this is a vibrant pink too. Like this, I haven't really seen this color in a definitely not in another head and plug. I would have expected them to just use the colors they already had going, but yeah, um, that's a cool one. Um, anything else about kind of where you where you look for fish for for early um, early trout? Uh, I think I kind of got what I was saying, but I mean. I think as far as finding new places, I would just look for the same stuff that you're kind of looking for in fall. Yeah. Um, you know, eddies, water moving. Islands around I, inlets. Islands around inlets, yeah. You know, river um, mouths. Good and, point. And whatnot. There's a, I really liked what you said too about 
you know, go back to where you were last catching them or late fall or late spring, early summer, you know, where, you know, and, and you can catch trout in North Carolina and Virginia. I mean, especially like the guys in Virginia and Maryland that catch speckled trout, they're catching them really well all summer. Um, but, you know, North Carolina south, it seems to get a little slower in some areas. You know, there's some areas where you still catch a bunch, but um, – and those warmer days, and then it picks back up. They're just a funny fish. Like, you talk to people in different areas. Like, the people are like, oh, yeah, the trout fish is insane all summer in Florida. And then you, same thing in Virginia. But North Carolina, the summer trout fishing can be kind of tough. But you get up on the Pamlico Sound, guys still catch trout really good all mm-hmm. summer. Um, but another big, big factor of my trout fishing this time of year is, like, we've got this mullet run going on and these massive wads of mullet. Like, if you can find a little bays or – pockets or sloughs where these mullet are getting like really stacked up and fishing around there with the top water and look, look for nervous bait look for where baits getting choked up or pushed around a point or sucked into a pocket those trout will definitely hang out there same with the redfish same with the flounder uh, a lot of times when you see like a bunch of mullet getting blown up you can get so sucked into to wanting to throw a top water to them but if you throw a jig under them like a lot of times you'll catch a lot of flounder sitting underneath those big schools of bait what about um? Because you've done this a lot more than I have. When's the time of year that uh, you can catch them pretty good in the surf? Is it during the mullet run? It, man, that's all. That's really. I think you can catch them probably starting right now. But that like late October, November, early December mm-hmm. is is kind of the time I think to to target trout in the surf. You can catch some big ones in the surf too. Yeah, some really big ones. I'm excited to. Uh, I would like to get out in the ocean and do some some redfish in the surf sometime soon too yeah yeah i didn't get to do that at all i think it was last september two septembers ago i I started having some pretty good days out there yeah um but need some offshore winds or some no winds which we have not had lately (laughs) and clear water and clear water so besides the red flag doa what are some of your your confidence go-to lures for for speckled trout this time here um okay besides the red flag definitely the small spooks um I love the trout tricks, uh, specifically that mood ring color. It's kind of like a dark God, purple. I hate that color. I love that color. I and just I have think, no confidence in it. <laughs> I, I think it works really well in low light yeah. because it's really opaque. Like it's not super see-through. Yeah. And I feel like that contrast early in the morning, it kind of, you know, trout are looking up and you're kind of, you're not working it on the bottom. You're kind of working it mid column. Um, to I guess lower column. Yeah. Um, man, I just I've had such good luck on that bait early early in the morning. So if they're not eating top water, I'll switch to that. And um, that dark color I think just does pretty well when it's when in low light. And then once it gets um a little bit higher sun and whatnot, I'll use that. Uh, was it the opening night color? Mm-hmm. That's more uh, translucent. It's got some, like, kind of crystal flakes in there and whatnot. Um, that color works well for me, like, kind of midday, mid-morning, uh, when the sun's a little higher. I think the something I really want to share, and I'm glad you brought up trout tricks because it reminded me of it, is, you know, you look at bass fishing. And we talk a lot about on this podcast how there's so much back and forth between the bass fishing world and saltwater, or more so the saltwater world taking from the bass fishing world. Um, but there is, you look at a trout trick. It's the only, in the bass world, a lot of times it's called like a stick bait, uh, a, mm-hmm. a soft plastic that's just like a straight, like a like a Cinco worm or a TRD. You know, those are called stick baits. So uh, a trout trick is essentially a stick bait or a, a soft plastic worm. Um, and that it's really the only worm saltwater worm that anyone's fishing or buying or like manufacturing. But I've talked to a lot of people that do really, really well on a lot of other different types of freshwater worms like Cinco's and, you know, Mm -hmm. Cinco knockoffs, a lot of the other stick baits. Um, and another thing that, that my eyes were open to by Elias is with a stick bait, a lot of times, you know, you're fishing it Texas rigged. For bass or you're fishing on a jig head or you're fishing a wacky which is where you take the hook and like put it through the middle so the hooks like here's the worm and the hooks going through like right here and then it just kind of wiggles and you can fish it with some weight on it like that like you could fish it on a jig head like that or you could fish it weightless but i think 
Well, I know that Elias has been doing really well fishing soft plastics like that for trout. Um, but that's something I really want to try more this year. Um, yeah. When that bait falls, when it's rigged wacky, it just does this little like wobble. So like both of the sides kind of wobble down and um, interesting. Bass love it. And I've, I've caught a couple of trout since he's talking about that fishing fishing a, tr- a trout trick like that. But I'm gonna try to keep a lot more you know stick style soft plastic baits in my boat this year. I think it's gonna be especially if you're in an area with low current, like all up on the Pamlico Sound. Mm-hmm. If you really know you're in the fish and you're having a hard time getting them to bite, or you're not, try fishing a stick bait rigged wacky. Throw it out there, let it fall. Uh, you can also rig or fish a, fish a wacky rigged stick bait, you know, in current. But if it's at ripping current, you know, I think it's going to be a harder bait to fish. But if it's slower current or you're working hard for your bites, it's a tactic that I think definitely needs to be tapped into in the trout fishing world. Um, are there any other trout trick colors that you fish or when you're throwing a trout trick, are you pretty much only going with that, that mood ring? Pretty much only. I, I keep like, <laughs> I have like one of those binders. Yeah. yeah I think you, you have the same ones. And I mean, it, it is literally, you can probably put like what, 15 packs in there yeah. or something like that. And it's like seven opening nights and eight mood rings. <laughs> so, <laughs> so confident in them. That that and honestly, man, that's what it takes is just the confidence in it. There's colors that are going to work better than others, but at the end of the day, having confidence and putting that bait where it needs to be is going to be the the telltale. Um, I want to pick your brain a little bit about how you like to. So, are you storing in those binders, mm-hmm. and you're using the Plano soft plastic yeah. binders, right? Yep. Um, that's what I'm using as well. I really, really like them. Um, are you? Doing a binder for trout tricks and then a binder for paddle tails and a binder for TRD. Like, is that kind of how you're breaking it down? Yeah, I for a while I only had one, and I would just anything that I was going to use that day, I would just fill it up with that stuff. Yeah. Um, but it got to the point where, like, especially if you're on fish and like someone's you know needs to, to replace their soft plastic. I'm like rifling through this thing, trying to find the right one. And, you know, throughout the day, they all just kind of get shoved in different sleeves. and I don't know where they are. Um, so now <laughs> I have like a binder for everything. I have a paddle tail binder, um, a Ned rig binder, um, or the soft plastics, I, soft plastics I use on Ned rigs and like the rage tails and whatnot. And then a um, jerk shad binder and a trout tricks yeah man it not 75 percent of the time it doesn't matter if you can get to it quickly and put it on yeah but 25 percent of the time it does and the 25 percent of the time that it does it that's when it really pays off to be organized yeah yeah no i think it's um i think being super organized in like your tackle preparation can um turn a good day into a great day yeah i would agree not all the time, but sometimes. And it feels good when you're on the water and you're organized and your boat's set up and you like <laughs> sit down and you open your hatch and you reach right to the binder that you need and open it to page three and pull your mood ring to trout. You know what I mean? Like it feels like <laughs> yeah. you know what you're doing. <laughs> so many times on the water, I'm like, you know, I've been on three days in a row fishing the same kind of stuff and, I, you know, I all this crap pulled out and thrown in my hatch and I'm like, leaning over it trying to make sure my clients can't see in my hatch of how unorganized it is and like fishing out the right soft plastic and jamming it on the hook which is not how i want to be but when you when you're not like i i I, not everyone's probably like this but most people that i know it's like you get your boat real organized and then it's like this slow process of it getting unorganized and all of a sudden it's it's decently unorganized and you can't find something and you need it quickly so then you're like tearing through everything and then all of a sudden it's just a total mess yeah yeah and that's, that, that's what I'm trying to get a little bit better at too, because my my boat is um, generally in the morning. It's like super organized, and by the end of the day, it's like there is crap everywhere. Yeah, and then I have to like reorganize everything that night. That's the same um, with me. But no, I mean it's. I think it it still helps to just have everything kind of there in place when you first get started. Um, but yeah, keeping it organized is a whole nother task within itself. I'm I'm bad about typically having way more crap in my boat than I need as far as tackle goes. Like, oh yeah, I'll have yeah. stuff on there all year that I never touch, 
and and whatnot. And the more you have in there, the more you're going to be unorganized. And this time of year too, moving into the fall where there's so much going on is a great time to get your boat really unorganized because Mm -hmm. you got so much junk in there. Do you have any other tactics? I know you're always kind of like pushing the envelope with like organization tactics. I remember you had the rubber bands on your treble hooks. Oh yeah. Yeah. I kind of did away with that because, um, it was just kind of annoying. I have to, you know, if we went through like five, used five different top waters in a day or something, I had to come back out and re rubber band all of them. Um, so that kind of fell apart, but I would like, uh, and I've been looking into those, those Plano edge boxes for like just a top water one, but I've kind of gotten to the point now where I'm like, do I really need to bring like a whole box of top waters with me every time I go fishing? And I think the answer to that is probably no. So now I just, I have a Plano box um, for different species. So I have a redfish Plano box, a trout Plano box, a uh, false albacore slash Spanish Plano box. And e- in each one, I might add to it or take some stuff out every time I go out. But it's to me, it's just a little bit easier um, to kind of have that, that way of organization. And so like the redfish box, I can fit like, five to six top waters in there and kind of depending on where you're fishing um and the water clarity kind of determines like what top waters i'm going to bring that day yeah um it takes a little bit of maintenance as far as like thinking about okay i need to take like these three out because i'm not going to use those today and put these three in type of thing yeah, for sure. It's it's uh, it's it. Everyone's got their own system that works for them. That's the thing, and finding that little hack, that little system. And I think less is more. I mean, you never want to get out there and not have what you need. Mm-hmm. Um, but the more you uh, the more you can kind of dial it in and, and figure out what you need and what you don't need, the better off you are. And and it's always good to have some extra and some backup stuff. But for sure, it's uh, it's a tough. Um, it's a tough, I don't know. It's just tough to figure out. My, I mean, my boat right now has got way too much stuff in it. I've been saying for weeks I need to go out there and pull a bunch of crap out and organize it. But there's some really good tools now. Like that, the new Plano boxes are really awesome. Are you using those yeah. Plano Edge boxes? Yeah, man, those things are a million times better than the ones that I used to use yeah. that were quote unquote waterproof. Um, I forget, I don't even know who makes them. They're just like the clear boxes that have that water seal around the top um and everything like would rust in those things and the plano ones i feel like you, you still get some rust but it's not it's not even close to as bad right right i would agree it's uh it's been really nice to i mean especially like i look at my spanish box that i've like thrown wet jigs into and it's been sitting in the front hatch of my pathfinder all summer and it's not rusting at all. I mean, and they've got those moisture wicking things in them that pull all the moisture off the off the baits. And those, I mean, uh, I've had those in other boxes too, and they work. But it, honestly, the way that it's worked, the way that it's worked in these new boxes, I've been really impressed with. So a little bit more expensive, but I would say definitely worth it, at least yeah. for like your main boxes. Like if you spend all, that's the thing is like I, a lot of times people are like, I can't spend thirty dollars on a tackle box, but you go spend. <laughs> You got freaking a hundred dollars worth of tackle right there, and you jam it in a crappy tackle box and it gets a little water in it, and then you're out all that tackle. So it's definitely, I think, worth its weight in gold to have a good a good tackle box that, that's going to keep that yeah. moisture out of there. Um, what what boxes are you running your uh, with your uh, flies in? Are you using cliff boxes still? Yeah, I use just cliff boxes. I have a um, um, I always say this, is it umka umqua. Um, I have an Umqua one as well, um, but it's you know it's pretty much the same thing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, don't, I mean those boxes have been fine. My my hatches are like fairly dry, so the flies don't really get wet, um, and they're easy to pull in and out. They are like a little large. I feel like they're kind of wide. Mm-hmm. Um, so in the market for something that might be a little slimmer if possible uh but 
Haven't really looked. What about you? I've been rocking the Cliffs boxes always. Um, I've I've pl- I've played around with some other stuff. I've used like some traditional tackle boxes, like Adam, good friend down in the Keys. He runs all his flies in like crappy tackle boxes. <laughs> mm-hmm. But you know he ties. It doesn't matter. He doesn't need to conserve flies like we do because he ties like ten flies a day. I mean he's got so many flies. He could probably fill up five trash bags with flies. <laughs> um, and big trash bags like the big black trash bags. So. He's got plenty, uh, plenty going on. But yeah, I like the Cliffs boxes. the The problem is, is like with a fly, it holds so much more moisture than a a bait, like a hard bait does, or whatnot, with the, the fibers and the hairs and the feathers and whatnot. And so, putting it back into like a sealed tackle box, it that moisture gets in everything because it kind of mm-hmm. comes out of it and goes in everything else. And that's what's nice about the Cliffs boxes. For that reason, is the moisture can escape the box. But that also means if you keep it in a damp area that the moisture can get into the box and, and get to the flies. So a fly box is definitely like the hatch that my fly box sits in. I always open it every night in the garage mm-hmm. just so air that you Let get the airflow air and everything. A lot of times, too, if I've got a, you know, I feel like I need to, I'll, I'll pop that cliff box open and just lay it on my seat on my skiff and let it dry out well. So, um, and especially in the fall, you know, when I'm, fishing for redfish in the morning and then albacore fishing in the afternoon and using spin rods and fly rods like it's important to get all that stuff back out and dry it out and and not ruin it so yeah no doubt have you started to think about your uh tackle organization and boat organization on the new boat (laughs) uh when i do it kind of stresses me out because i'm like man i need you know four spanish rods i need you know trolling rods and i need some near shore bottom digging rods, and I need this and that, and I'm like, oh god, I need to start saving up now because I'm sure as hell don't have enough to get it all <laughs> in, my, in my current situation. That, um, t- it'll be a, it'll be a slow build for sure. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you what, it's like, and you want four stout bait rods for that boat, you know, four, yeah. like like medium fast or medium seven foot medium heavies or medium fast, just for Carolina rigging. Um, I used to try to transfer tackle every day. Like if I was on my bay boat, I I would run a tackle bag, and I'd always forget something. And so now I've just started keeping stuff on both boats, keeping rods, yeah. and it's taken me a while to build up, you know, the arsenal of tackle and gear. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, but um, it's way better that way. You don't forget anything. It sucks when you're like, yeah, all right, we're gonna go top water fish in the morning. You get out there, you're like, oh, well, no, we're not. We don't have any top water flies. <laughs> Yeah. So uh, that has not happened, but I have definitely had times where I'm like, uh, there was one time, this was maybe two years ago, I just remember this, that we were going trout fishing from my Jones Brothers, this is when I used to have the Jones Brothers, and got out there and had grabbed four rods, stuck them on the boat, none of them had anything tied on them, which was fine, I had all my tackle that I needed. So get out there, go to rig up some trout rods, and this was like probably late November. And I had been albacore fishing the day before, had some fly rods on the boat. I go to grab, cut some leader, try to look for my spool leader. I've got no leader. So I've just got four spin rods with braid. Water's super clear, and we're going trout fishing. And I'm like, oh crap, what do I do? So I cut all my leaders off of my fly rods. Like, didn't tell them what was going on, and started like, I coiled them up, put them in the little. Uh, thing on my console and was like every time I needed to put some new leader on I just pull some of that fly on leader out and cut it and tie it onto the rod <laughs> and uh, it worked fine we caught a bunch of trout but you know it's it's definitely nice to, to keep everything spread out on both both uh, boats for sure I feel like there's there's like some uh, essential things that you have to pretty much always have in your boat yeah one definitely being leader yeah. two being something to cut it with yeah if you're not like me i I like can't bite the leader with my teeth um and what else probably some jig heads jig heads egg sinkers swivels circle hooks like on my on my bay boat i always have egg sinkers swivels circle hooks beads Mm -hmm. and i keep four rods on there all the time no matter what medium fast seven foot hmg medium fast I keep reels on those rods, you know. 
<laughs> obviously. And then I keep two big rods. I, and for my Spanish trolling, because I do it so little, I run my uh, my jigging rods. So I've got carnivore, okay. pen, carnivore, like group of jigging rods. Uh, Planters, yeah. Yeah, they're stiff. They're real stout jigging rods. Um, mm-hmm. and, they, and they do really well. And honestly, a lot of people do better. Like people who have not fished at all do better picking up a spin rod or just leaving it in the rod holder and reeling in the, that heavy planer with that Spanish skipping across the surface that's 15 inches long. <laughs> yeah, so, I totally agree. But, well, I think that's a good wrap. Can you think of anything else that we need to share with people to get them fired up about fall fishing? Um, Always have a top water tied on. Just always have that. a top water. <laughs> always have a DOA rip. Like, I think... Um, I know we've talked about this before, but maybe this would be a good way to end is if you had four rods, what would be on? Because like, I feel like trout fishing is known for like, you oh, have four like, rods for trout fishing. Yeah. You had like four, you have like four <sighs> rods or five rods and they all have something different on them because trout can be picky on like what they're eating that day Oh yeah, or, or where they want it in the water column type of thing so if you had four rods what would they be i would have a red flake doa a one knocker head and one knocker chartreuse and white or just all chartreuse probably i would have a rainbow trout colored mr17 and i would have a shrimp po' boy trout trick on a 316th redfish eye there you go how about you um red flake spook junior um probably in pink and a popping cork with a voodoo shrimp and it's a good one. A trout trick mood ring on a quarter ounce jig head, ice strike jig head. I think we'd catch us some trout. We got some good bait in there. <laughs> <laughs> we'd catch something. We'd Might catch something. Fish. Oh, dude, I cannot wait for the lizard fish to push in thick. It's going to be good. That's going to be great. Well, cool. Well, guys, thanks for checking out another episode. We'll see you next week. Hopefully we'll be getting this guest on. We've been trying for a little while. So um, stay tuned and we'll see you soon. Later.